The last time we dove into the world of Joshi, we looked at the All-Star Dream Slam from 1993, an absolute belter of a card featuring top action from the beginning to the end, including several classic bouts. It's a special night for women's wrestling, and the first ever women's card to earn over a million dollars just from the gate alone. And, well, it inspired all Japan women to try something even bigger. The next year, in November, Japan's oldest wrestling company, once again with the help of JWP, LLPW and FMW, not to mention others, would make their way to the Tokyo Dome for what remains the biggest women's wrestling show in history. Domu Superwoman Great War, Big Egg Wrestling Universe. Approximately 42,500 people made their way into the Dome for a quite staggering 23 match, 10 plus hour supercard that featured just about every major Joshi talent going and lots else besides. From a tournament featuring the very best wrestlers in the world to the showcasing of legends and younger talents, from a few spots of kickboxing and amateur wrestling to a title match put on by the WWF, hell, there'd even be a men's match. It's often just a silly turn of phrase to say that a show's got everything, but in Big Egg Universe's case, it absolutely does apply. And it's high time we had a look at this behemoth. Now, obviously covering Big Egg Universe is a seriously intimidating task. Again, this is a 23-match show. It would be absolutely maniacal to try and cover every last second of it because, well, we'd be here for hours and hours. I'm usually long-winded, but there are limits. However, it is a show that has a big centrepiece, a massive story going in that was the main pull of the card. And that centrepiece is the V-Top 5 Star Tournament, a one-night spectacular featuring eight of the top wrestlers from the Big Freeze Yoshi Promotions and FMW taking part, duking it out for a prize pot of 15 million yen and the honour of being the best Yoshi wrestler in the world. Now, usually when it comes to 1994, people would say that New Japan's Super J-Cup is the best one-night tournament going, perhaps the best one ever. And, well, that's hardly an incorrect opinion. But the V-Top tournament is, at the very least, a contender. And so, while we'll certainly touch on all the various happenings on the card, because obviously there's a lot to talk about, the tournament will be the main focus. So, let's get on with it. This is the Big Egg Wrestling Universe the biggest event in the history of women's wrestling. You may well know a good bunch of the people who are going to be in this tournament. There's Aja Kon, Manami Toyota, Dynamite Kansai, Yumiko Hota. Just that quartet alone represents a ridiculous amount of talent and a hell of a lot of popularity. All of them are all-time greats. But even at this time in the Joshi world, when things were going so well and the quality was so consistently off the scale, one name stands out above all, the woman who was, in a lot of people's eyes, the best wrestler in the world, male or female, Akira Hokuto. When we looked at the Dream Slam, we saw that ungodly war between Hokuto and the top star of Ladies Legends Pro Wrestling, Shinobu Kandori, a truly vicious epic encounter that completely stole the show. And well, Hokuto's star has only shone brighter since then. Just through the rest of 1993 alone, her big singles bouts against the likes of Yumiko Hota, Manami Toyota, Aja Kon and Mayomi Ozaki, not to mention another staggering battle against Kandori to round off the year, are beyond compare. Quite simply, in 1993, no one in the world, male or female, was on the level of the Dangerous Queen. Frankly, no one was even remotely close. Still, everyone knew that Hakuto had a weakness. It's something that kind of defined her career, really. And that was her propensity for getting injured. Hokuto essentially broke out big through injury. Back in 1987, early on in her Zenjo career, when she was still under her real name of Hisako Uno, the first fall of a tag titles match between the team of Uno and Hota and Azure Nagahori and Yumi Ogura would see one of the most outrageous spots ever seen in wrestling up to that point. Ogura wins the first fall by pinning Uno after a freaking tombstone pile driver from the second rope. It was absolutely insane and it broke his Uno's neck. The spot itself isn't the craziest part though. That would probably be his Uno continuing to work the entirety of the second and third falls, often quite literally holding her head in place and barely taking a half step backwards. Particularly nowadays, such a thing completely boggles the mind, but it sure was tough. 
Hisako Uno was out for eight months following the match, but on her return, the persona that defined her, the blonde hair, the masks, the sword, the new name that paid homage to Akira Maeda, gradually took hold. Still, Akira Hakuto would suffer plenty of other nasty injuries over the years, often during the course of bouts or just before major ones. But she would usually continue forward unless it was clearly impossible, and the amount of bandages that she'd often come to Lorin with would earn her another nickname outside of Dangerous Queen, that being the Mummy. Alas, at the end of 1993, it looked as though all those injuries were going to come to a head. Following victory with Manami Toyota in the year-end tag team tournament, Hokuto announced that she intended to retire from professional wrestling in 1994, citing the injuries she'd suffered as the major reason. In something that casts a different sort of hue to the incredible 1993 she'd had, All Japan Women did know about Hakuto's intentions to retire for most of the year. They certainly got as much from Hakuto as possible, knowing this. The plan initially was for Hakuto to work three bouts for AJW, the Yokohama Arena on March 27th, August 24th at Nippon Budokan, and then finally November 20th at the Dome. However, these weren't the only three matches that Hakuto would work. This was also around the time when she started working in Mexico for CMLL. Working as Reina Jabuki, which translates to Rainstorm, Hakuto naturally hit the ground running, had the Mexican press calling her the Michael Jordan of wrestling, and it didn't take long for her to move there and actually get married to Antonio Gomez Medina, better known as Mascara Magica. It did kind of become clear over the course of the year that Hakuto leaving wasn't so much full retirement as it was fully leaving for Mexico, but her marriage to Mascara Magica did end up being rather short-lived. Well before 1994 was out, they'd divorced, and Hakuto had moved back to Japan. And so, a month or so before the Dome show, a new storyline was set. Hakuto will compete in the VTOP tournament, and if she ends up winning it, then she will not retire. The lighter schedule had, it was said, done wonders for her conditioning, and she felt it possible that she could keep on going. This is most definitely the main storyline going into Big Egg Universe, although obviously there's a lot more to look at. The November 20th Dome Show itself was announced a few days before December 1993's St. Battle Final event, and it was certainly viewed as a risk. Despite the huge success of the Dream Slam, the Dome is obviously an altogether bigger matter. At the very least, it was going to have to be a huge interpromotional affair. A big part of the show was presenting it as a 40th anniversary celebration, 40 years since Mildred Burke's November 1954 tour of Japan, which tends to officially be regarded as the beginning of Yoshi due to its huge success, although there was certainly women's wrestling in the country years before then. As the year went on, outside of the inner inaction, and as we got closer to the dome, news items gradually came through about it, including some rather weird ones. Maybe we could have seen Tonya Hardin at the Dome. That could have indeed been a thing. In March of 1994, AJW boss Takashi Matsunaga said that he was going to offer the now disgraced figure skater a $2 million contract to become a Zenjo wrestler, and Akira Hakuto even offered to train her. Obviously, this was when the whole Tonya and Nancy Kerrigan story was a giant news item, and this offer certainly set some tongues ragging, even outside of Japan. The idea of Tonya Harding wrestling in Japan most certainly made it to mainstream American news. Initially, the whole thing did appear to be a silly little publicity stunt, but as the weeks went on, it did become clear that some negotiations were taking place. According to the Matsunaga brothers, Hardin's team were apparently demanding $2 million for one match at the Dome, a frankly astronomical and honestly ludicrous amount of money for a single shot, so who knows if that's even true. It is perhaps surprising just how long this story went for, but by the start of May it did eventually become clear that this wasn't going to happen. Shockingly enough, AJW and Tonya's team couldn't agree on the financials. A more accurate reason as to why this never had a chance of happening though, was that Tonya still had a quite staggering insurance policy on her legs from her figure skating days, as in millions of dollars. Tonya still held out hope for a return to her actual sport, and obviously those pins weren't worth risking for a wrestling show. They did try later on just to bring her in as a special guest, but that also didn't happen. That being said, even the whispers of it potentially happening were enough to warrant a huge amount of newspaper inches, such was the interest in the whole Tonya Harding story. 
It was, if nothing else, a successful publicity stunt, and you can probably chalk up a fair bit of its success to a name you're likely familiar with, Zenjo's head of PR and manager of talent, Rossi Agawa. As it is, Tonya Hardin actually did get involved in one wrestling show. She appeared on a June 22nd Sandy Bar promoted show in Portland as Lorin Valet for Los Gringos Locos, the legendary team of Eddie Guerrero and Love Machine Art Bar. In other less outlandish happenings, the true card gradually takes shape over the course of the year. Damn near anyone who's anyone in the current world of Yoshi will be participating, not to mention a few legends. Jaguar Yokota, after retiring in 1985, will be making her official return to Lorin, as will Lioness Asuka, who'd retired in 1989. Jigusa Nagayo will be there once again, although she now cuts a more heelish figure than before. She's at the head of something called Gaia that was formed at the end of August. At this stage, Gaia isn't very well understood by the Western press. The Observer considered it to be a totally worked new promotion operating inside of All Japan, when it would actually end up being a very real promotion indeed. Naturally, JWP, LLPW and FMW are all going to be involved in this show, but there's also the WWF involvement, which centres entirely around Bull Nakano and Alundra Blaze. Nakano and Blaze, the latter better known as Medusa in Japan from her own AJW years, started working together in May when the Fed toured Japan, and the feud would quickly come to TV with matches first on Monday Night Raw and then at SummerSlam 1994. The November the 20th show would feature Blaze defending the WWF women's title against Nakano, and it would be Bull's last appearance in the company before embarking on a month's long tour as a WWF regular. The field for the V-Top tournament to decide the top women's wrestler in the world gradually takes shape. Hakuto's in it, and naturally so is Arja Khan. Arja's storyline going into the tournament is pretty simple. She's the unquestioned top dog in the company. By the time the Dome Show rolls around, Arja Khan will have been holder of the WWWA World Championship, the company's top title, for a few days short of two years. She is the Jungle Emperor, one of the most dominant forces in wrestling history, the woman God made when he wanted the real Finn, all of that. Arja's title will not be on the line in the tournament, but naturally she is the favourite. Representatives of JWP, LLPW and FMW will also be taking part, as will a couple of other AJW folk. Those will be decided in the company's Grand Prix tournament. Eventually, we finally end up with this lineup. First, we have Hakuto and Con. The other company's entrants are JWP's Dynamite Kansai, LLPW's Eagle Sawai, FMW's Combat Toyoda. Some of these choices may be surprising. You might have expected to see Shinobu Kandori turn out for LLPW, or Megumi Kudo for FMW. But, well, politics as usual. Other companies don't want their top stars to job that way. As it is, we will see both of those talents on the card anyway. AJW's Grand Prix fills up two more spots on August 28th. We have tournament winner Yumiko Hotta and runner-up Manami Toyota. Which leaves one more spot. We'll save that for a bit. And with this, well, most of the major pieces are set. We should start looking at the show in earnest. Of course, there will be a bunch more news items to look at along the way, but we'll throw those in as needed. As mentioned already, this is a gargantuan show, and our focus is on the big tournament that's going to take up most of the second half of the supercard. Still, there's plenty worth looking at in the show's first half, that's for sure. And so while we're not going to look at every match in detail, we're certainly going to have a rundown. Happily, the full Big Egg Wrestling universe is available right here on YouTube. More than that, it's available in absolutely stunning quality. Like, better than any other show from that time. And so, a big thanks is in order to Big Jewel. I'll link to that channel because they're responsible not only for this tremendous rip, but also equally beautiful rips of The Dream Slam, Dream Rush, Wrestling Queendom and various other classic 90s AJW shows. This full DVD also features a lot of the important preamble, the fans making their way into the arena, the interviews, the conferences, and of course, all the awesome presentation. 
Make no mistake, right from the opening bell, this is a show where AJW aren't going to take any half measures. They've got this dome and they're damn well going to use it for a truly state of the art production. As we reach around about 2pm on November 20th 1994 and the opening bell strikes, a crowd of approximately 42,500 people have made or are making their way into the arena. The attendance was something that people had worried a little about, especially seeing as Zenjo hadn't been able to fill out the 17,000 seat Yokohama Arena venue for 1993's Dream Slam earlier in the year. But 42,500 in the dome for a Joshi show? That's already a huge number. The previous record attendance for a women's show in Japan was, reportedly, a mark of 19,000 that Mildred Burke had set during that original November 1954 tour. Needless to say, that mark has been royally smashed. And so, as the opening ceremonies finish, it's time for the spectacle to truly begin. A lot of the show's first half consists of pretty quick matches of around 10 minutes or so, so running through them's not too tricky. We start with a rather cool tag contest featuring three newer talents, Bomi Hikaru and Chapurita Asari take on Hiromi Sugi and Hiromi Yegi. Bomi Hikaru is the more experienced wrestler here and is a part of Chigusa Nagao's new Gaia group, while Chapurita Asari is probably the most well known of this quartet. One thing worth noting that perhaps demonstrates how tough it is to make it not just in AJW, but in Puro in general, is that Asari was part of AJW's 1993 class. Here in late 1994, she's not just the only one of that class still in All Japan Women, she's the only one who's actively wrestling. Full stop. Asari became known for being an absolutely wild high flyer, and this first match sees one of the most outrageous moves of the whole show, Asari coming off top for her signature Sky Twister press to the outside. Shortly after, Asari executes a spinning dropkick on Hiromi Sugo for the win, but this is a very nice opener where Asari and Yegi, in particular, definitely impress. And this is followed by… a little person comedy match, Buta Genjin and Little Great Muta taking on Tomezo Tsunakaki. I told you this show would have everything. All sorts of silliness abounds in this short comedy bout, of course, but it's here as a nod to Joshi Proe's history. Back in the 50s and 60s, Joshi often shared space on cards with little person bouts and the like because back then they were all considered as, for lack of a better word, freak shows. Happily times have changed. A couple of other quickfire spot fests with newer talent follow. Kandi Akutsu, Zenjo's junior champion, and Rui Tamada have a decent enough little bout, which Akutsu wins with her signature rolling German suplex. This bout was the final of a juniors tournament. The fourth bout, however, is the first that's generally considered a must-see, Suzuka Minami taking on Kaoru Maeda. Kaoru, again, is a part of the Gaia group, while Minami is actually coming close to the end of her career, and the two really put on a show here. Much like the earlier Dream Slam shows, the pace of these matches is often going to be fast as hell, meaning most things are exciting to watch, and this pair really go well with each other. There's a lot of exciting spots and moves, but also some good details and story too. Minami eventually picks up the win here with an absolutely thunderous Liger Bomb, but both do very well. Minami was always a very strong talent, although she did stick to what I suppose you would call the traditional AJW formula. She retired the following year at the age of 26. Conversely, Kaoru would have a very long and very varied career. She'd go on to some serious heights in Gaia, especially, and she wouldn't retire until August of 2022. The next section is certainly the most skippable part of the whole card. We do get a quartet of different style matches, meaning shoots. One kickboxing match, one regular boxing match, and two amateur wrestling bouts. Again, this grab bag sort of action is a bit of a nod to early Yoshi history. While there's not a massive amount to say here, there's a couple of names of note. AJW's Kamiko Meikawa wins the kickboxing match against Sugar Mayuki, and while she's not too well known in the West, she would be a pretty major talent for Zenjo in the latter part of the 90s, naturally famous for strong kicks. Unfortunately, All Japan were in major decline during this period, which is why she's sadly not better known. 
One of the amateur wrestling bouts features the 16-year-old Kyoko Hamaguchi against a more experienced French wrestler, Doris Blint. Kyoko being the daughter of pro wrestler and legendary New Japan trainer Higo Animal Hamaguchi. Kyoko had already been featured a little on TV and the like as a wrestling prodigy, although in this instance a pro wrestling win is hardly an ideal place to put on an amateur match, what with the ropes being in the way and so on. Animal Hamaguchi is also here in support of her daughter, as he would often be throughout Kyoko's career. While she wouldn't follow her father into pro wrestling, she had an excellent amateur career, including two Olympic bronze medals and five world championships. Up next we have a couple of matches where temperatures run a bit high. Chigusa Nagayo faces off against Reggie Bennett, and Chigusa strikes something of an angry figure. She's flipping Reggie off, and the two end up getting into it on the ramp. The match itself is the sort that is right in the Chigusa wheelhouse, lots of selling against a bigger opponent, and it generally turns out okay, although the finish is a little botched with Chigusa rolling Reggie up and Reggie kicking out when she wasn't supposed to. Apparently this miscommunication was due to Reggie being deaf in one ear and the ref's count happening on her deaf side. Chigusa gets on the house mic and essentially says that the Japanese crowds are never going to believe in a gaijin. Now as an aside, gaijin is a very derogatory term, especially in this context, which is why I don't tend to use it nowadays as a term for a foreign wrestler. In fact, Chigusa actually gets some serious boos from the crowd for using the word. By the way, if you are a fan of foreign wrestlers swearing in Japan, Reggie Bennett does have a choice line or two in the post-match press conference. There's no reason in the world for somebody to be saying, fuck you this, fuck you that. I'm not that type of person, and please excuse my language. Apparently Chigusa's anger continued a fair bit backstage due to this botched finish. It is kind of a weird one, this. This is a transitory phase for Chigusa Nagayo, really, being that this is her last match in AJW before the full debut of Gaia Japan. As popular as Zenjo is right now, it's a very different and more male audience to the young female one that existed in her heyday, and as legendary as she is, she is perhaps not as over as you'd expect, although she'd only wrestled a few times since her 1993 return. This match then does mark the end of a chapter. Gaia Japan fully opens its doors and runs its first show in April of 1995, she makes a full-time return to the ring, and with the success of Gaia, she successfully reinvents herself, as the greats tend to do. The following match really brings the pain. AJW's Toshio Yamada and Tomoko Watanabe take on LLPW's Shinobu Kandori and Mikiko Futagami. Oh boy, when Yamada and Kandori go at it, they seriously do. The amount of hate between the pair is something. Both Yamada and especially Kandori have legit backgrounds in wrestling and judo respectively, and they'll happily use them. It's damn good, one of many matches on the card that's well worth the watch. Watanabe and Futagami also fill their roles well, but this is definitely the Yamada and Kandori show. Eventually, however, the lethal submissions of Kandori do win out. After several attempts, she's finally able to lock in the Fujiwara armbar on Yamada in the centre, with Watanabe out of commission, and Yamada has no choice but to tap. A fine match, but there is actually more to talk about. Backstage drama. Not between this pair, but between Kandori and Akira Hakuto. Before the match, they'd met backstage for the first time in a few months, and they nearly went at it. Kandori sucker punched Hokuto, and they almost started properly duking it out before your mother broke it up. Backstage fights? At the biggest show in the company's history? In my oh so respectful and sport like Japanese Yoshi professional wrestling? Well, it's likelier than you'd think. Sadly, we have no CCTV record of this action to look back on so that we can judge who's to blame based on our pre existing biases. So, hey ho. The LLPW crew were very pissed off about the whole thing, with Kandori and company founder Rumi Kazama even trying to convince Eagle Sawai to shoot on Hakuto during their upcoming match at the VTOP tournament. And so this card kind of marks the end of a working relationship between LLPW and AJW, at least for now. Following this show, it would be quite a while before any LLPW talent stepped foot back into an All Japan Women win, with Kandori herself not returning until the second half of 1997. 
Speaking of brawling, albeit happily of a worked nature, next up is a UWA World Tag Titles match between the teams of LLPW's Michiko Nagashima and Yasha Kuenai versus the defending champions Etsuko Mita and Mima Shimoda, aka Las Cachorras Orientales or the Oriental Bitches. LCO, Wicked Entrance and all, are going to be one of the best tag teams of the 1990s, and whenever they're in the ring, <laughs> things are going to get rowdy. And sure enough, there's plenty of rule-breaking action going on in this match, although Mito and Shimoda are also exceptional pro wrestlers. The LLPW team are certainly overmatched in this bout, but they try hard, even occasionally beating LCO to the punch with weapons attacks, but eventually the champs do defend. Mita plants Nagashima with a sick Death Valley bomb, a move that she originated. Up next is the Legends exhibition, and man this one ends up going great. Jaguar Yokota and Linus Asuka are coming out of retirement, as are their respective partners Bison Kimura and Magic Cat Yumi Ogura. We get to the old school ref Jimmy Kayama along for the ride too. Everyone does well here, but Yokota and Asuka are the real stars. They start the match off and it takes seconds for them to show they haven't lost even the slightest step. This is especially true of Yokota. You wouldn't believe for a second that this is her first match since frickin 1985. We get classics from all four of them. Great high flying, some killer hair tossers, the Asuka giant swing, awesome Jaguar Yokota moves. It's great! Unfortunately, this match ends in a slightly longer than 10 minutes draw, but they could have certainly gone on longer. Hell, Yakota looks like she could have gone way freaking longer. This match went so well, in fact, that three out of the four participants decided to make full returns to the win. Yakota would return to Zenjo action the following year before setting up her own promotion, JD Star, at the end of 1995, and she would take Lioness Asuka and Bison Kimura along for the wide, who also both started wrestling for AJW again in 95. Yumi Yagura was the only one of the four who decided to stay retired, although she would return nine years later for Zenjo's 35th anniversary. And as for Yakota, <laughs> well she's still going at the age of 62, primarily for pro wrestling Diana. What can you say? She's a machine. Following an intermission that's mainly focused on an exhibition for Indian professional wrestling, we have one last match before we finally get to the tournament, but it is another one that's worth a bit of detail. The debut of what was hoped would be a big new cross-promotional character for the company, a crime-fighting pro wrestler named Blizzard Yuki. The Yuki character would be played by the usually excellent Saki Hasegawa, there would be a manga series in the Shonen Ace magazine, and even a Super Famicom game, Bishoujo Wrestler Retsuden Blizzard Yuki Wanyu. Blizzard Yuki was supposed to be a big deal, hence the debut here against Mariko Yoshida, and it comes with the biggest entrance of the show, a load of Yuki lookalikes doing martial arts moves to the sound of Yamato Sweet No. 4, music that you likely associate more with Takamichinoku, and even, in by far the single most ludicrous spot on the whole show, a stuntman Yuki alike doing a nearly 20 foot drop from a freaking cage onto basically no padding. Uh, yeah, needless to say, he got injured. All this leads to the real deal coming out, and then the match which is… not very good, unfortunately. The crowd is unfortunately rather dead for it, we're already in the fifth or so hour of this show, and you sense a bit of impatience. Hasegawa, as Yuki, is in an unenviable position of having to debut this new character, with new moves, in this huge arena, and it's clearly overwhelming. It's perhaps not surprising that Mariko Yoshida looks better here, although Yoshida would go on to be an all-time great. We do get a couple of very nice moves, particularly a tope con hilo from Yuki where she lands on her feet, but it doesn't really pull the crowd in. Eventually Yuki wins following a twist in senton. Hasegawa is clearly very emotional after the match and doesn't give an interview. Word was that she was also pretty concerned about the aforementioned stuntman and lap fall. So basically you have all these things that ended up contributing to a rather shocking debut, one that it's tricky to really blame Hasegawa for. Blizzard Yuki was more of an alter ego for Hasegawa, a character that she'd break out a few times while mostly still working under her real name, but Hasegawa's retirement in March of 1996 due to injuries meant that the character's time did end up being pretty brief. So. After all this time, we're finally getting to the tournament. I'm sure you may be thinking that this show might be just a little bit too long and… well, you'd be right. Still, we're here now. 
let's go through those participants again. Akira Hokuto, who may retire depending on the results of this tournament. Arja Khan, AJW's top dog and dominant champion. Yumiko Hotta and Manami Toyota, winner and runner-up respectively of the year's Grand Prix. Combat Toyota, four-time FMW Women's Champion. Dynamite Kansai, who'd recently held the JWP Openweight title for nearly two years. Eagle Sawai, one of the toughest competitors in LLPW. And, ah, we still have an open slot. This is a bit of an odd one. Originally, it appears as though this slot would be filled by Devil Masami. That was the report in The Observer. However, Masami wouldn't be in the tournament. She beat Kansai on September the 18th for the Openweight title, and JWP clearly weren't willing to have their champion and one of their biggest stars jobbing in the tournament. For similar reasons, LLPW's Shinobu Kandori and FMW's Megumi Kudo would not be in the tournament, although it's quite surprising that Devil Masami ended up not being on the card at all. She's one of the highest profile names to not be here, alongside fellow JWP wrestler Mayomi Ozaki, another person you may have expected to see in this tournament. Azaki's absence is also hazy, but it has to do with heat between her and AJW's talent head and booker, Rossi Agawa. Azaki has said that it was related to her age, which is, well, questionable on Rossi's part, seeing as Azaki was 26, but then I wouldn't be surprised. In any case, after March 1994, it would be 10 years before Azaki stepped foot into a Zenjo ring again. So, who takes the position? For a long time, it was actually said that Dynamite Kansai was going to get a bye to the semi-final. However, the position was eventually filled at the last minute due to the cancellation of another match on the card. Kyoko Inoue was previously booked to have a mixed style match against Lucia Riker, an undefeated Dutch champion kickboxer who was, at various times, described as the most dangerous woman in the world. Initially, Riker pulled out when she realised it was a work, although she soon came around and decided to do the match. But when she realised she was going to be losing the bout, she pulled out again, citing an ankle injury. She does actually appear on the show to apologise for her absence. In any case, this freed up Kyoko Inoue to take part in the V-Top tournament, and she'll face Kansai in the first round. The other first round bouts will see Akira Hakuto meet Eagle Sawai and Aja Khan face off against Manami Toyota, two bouts where you imagine that Speed's going to be facing off against Strength. But we open up the tournament with Yumiko Hotta, Grand Prix winner, MMA practitioner and general badass, against FMW's Combat Toyota. Let's get going. Hotta definitely goes into this first match as the favourite. She may be smaller than Toyota, but she's the Grand Prix winner, and she's certainly got something that can cut Combat down to size. That being her kicks. Hotter is a vicious striker, and it doesn't take all that long for her to slap and kick that oversized wind eyeliner directly off Toyota's face. Toyota, of course, does get a few chances here and there to stick some power moves in, but it's very easy to get into a perilous position against someone like Hotter, especially if you get trapped upside down in the ropes and Hotter's able to land some more vicious kicks right at you. This match quickly develops into something absolutely excellent, as the power of combat and the strikes of Hotta pair up beautifully, with there also being enough trash talk and character from these two to keep you invested in the slower moments, which, well, there aren't many of. Moves like the power bomb and the combat driver aren't enough to keep Hotta down, and Hotta's strong enough to perform her own big moves on Toyota. A couple of tiger drivers result in some very close near falls. Hotter hits an absolutely wild straightjacket suplex from the corner, but Toyota somehow survives that. That's a move I've never seen before. Even a slight misstep on a top rope spinning heel kick isn't enough to really cloud the match, and Toyota seems to be dead weight after Hotter lands it the second time. Hotter's frustration shows as she assaults Toyota with kick after kick, enough that the referee has to repeatedly pull her away, and in the midst of the argument, Toyota gets a fleeting opportunity. She hits a bridging German suplex and gets the upset free count in 16 minutes 54. Hotter is utterly raging. She basically has the ref by the neck and the seconds have to pull her away. This match is bloody awesome, an absolutely fantastic tournament opener and I would say the best match of Combat Toyota's career. Hotta is understandably upset in the post-match press interview, while Toyota goes on to face the winner of the next match. 
Eagle Sawai is certainly dressed to the max for this occasion, although it's hard to beat Akira Hakuto in this regard. She comes out all in blue, complete with signature big wig, sword and Mayu mask. Sawai's best opportunity is going to come by rushing out of the blocks, which indeed she does. She blasts Hakuto with power moves and gets a couple of near falls, largely controlling the first half of the match. There's a few very nice moves here, particularly a stalling double arm backbreaker, but Sawai misses a Vader bomb and Hakuto pushes back with a couple of spin kicks. Hakuto being Hakuto, naturally she'll make the big jump to the outside, but an attempt to pull Sawai back in by the hair ultimately leads to being knocked off and getting hit with a drop kick. Bit of a slow spot that one. Sawai tries the Vader bomb again, but Hakuto gets her feet up. She manages to get Sawai over for a couple of German suplexes, but Sawai makes a last ditch attempt at an armbar when Hakuto tries for the Northern Lights bomb. However, Hakuto escapes. Sawai tries a power bomb, Hakuto escapes again, hits a backdrop. Somehow Sawai survives the first Northern Lights and even manages to get a small package when Hakuto goes for it again, but naturally the Dangerous Queen is not going to be denied. A second Northern Lights bomb is enough for Hakuto to advance in 11 minutes 08. This is a very classic sort of Hakuto match where she overcomes the bigger opponent, and it's an okay bout. The crowd don't get too into it, although I largely think that's because they didn't exactly buy Sawai as a credible opponent. Not that Sawai does anything bad, she's just not really on the elite level that the other wrestlers in this tournament are at. It's fair to say that the next match promises good fins. Aja Kon vs Manami Toyota. This is the first time that the pair have met in singles since 30th August 1992, when Kon beat Toyota in the Grand Prix final, and well, they've only kicked on as talent since then. And yet, well, this is a match that's going to be stratospheric, even for them. If Arja is the daughter of Kin Kon, then Toyota is her scream queen. It's hard to really go through this as every last second of this match is so intense and filled with action, whether it's Toyota going up top for those big moves, or Arja's exceptional powerful grapples, or just stretching and tying up Toyota like she's a bloody pretzel. Every last dramatic Toyota bridge out puts the Tokyo Dome crowd on the edge of their seat. It's not always been easy for this show to get the sort of big reactions from this crowd that they'd get in other smaller venues, but this pair does it with ease. There are some particular moments that stand out. The absolutely sick inverted power slam that Arja does to Toyota on the ramp, the huge dive from Toyota onto a prone Arja on the table, that damned drop kick to the outside, the freaking victory star drop, but really just everything here is gold. Both of them throw the entire book at each other and then some. After a little over 17 minutes, Arja makes a critical reversal, sitting thunderously on Manami after a failed sunset flip in the corner. Toyota tries to reverse a backdrop, but is met with the Uraken. Somehow Toyota survives, but Arja then lifts her up and absolutely plants her with a Steiner screwdriver. And it's over. Absolute classic, this match. You must watch this. Both of these wrestlers are already on the top level, and this is where their rivalry really kicks into gear. The matches that this pair are going to have over the next couple of years, oh boy, it's a whole other level. This match got 5 stars from the Observer, and the tournament is worth watching just for this bout alone. We close out the first round with another contest that's got a lot of promise, Kyoko Inoue going up against Dynamite Kansai. You've got the showiness and heart of Kyoko against JWP's most prominent tough hombre, and once again this match absolutely meets high expectations. Kyoko certainly got the spirit to match up against Kansai's strikes, as vicious as they are, Kansai's kicks can be utterly ruthless. Kyoko uses her speed to try and get the advantage, whether it's through handspring elbows or other more daring moves, and you do get a bit of showiness, such as a big old giant swing on the dome's ramp. Again, this is just another fantastic pairing. Kyoko is strong enough as well to be able to kick out of Kansai's Splash Mountain while delivering some more big shots, a very nasty elbow smash from the corner to the back of the head for example. Kansai Lo has enough to kick out of some of Inoue's best, like the Niagara Driver. 
There is very little between these two all the way to the finish, but it's Inoue who makes the error. She goes to the top rope, but is met with a vicious kick that spins her right round. Kansai goes up and makes sure of it with the most devastating move in her arsenal, the die-hard Kansai, a splash mountain from the second rope. This match rounds off an absolutely stunning first round of action. Considering that this pair had to follow the freaking Con Toyota match, they're damn near as good and they keep the crowd's energy right up. Of course you would expect such greatness from these two. Kyoko Inoue in particular is right on the cusp of what would be, in 1995, a legendary wrestling year, and Kansai is one of those who just is never not great. The semi-finals are set then. Combat Toyoda will face Akira Hakuto, and Daja Khan will take on Dynamite Kansai. Judging by the first round of action, we can expect plenty more awesome stuff later on. We do get two matches in between the first round and the semi-finals, and well, they're worth a little bit of coverage at the very least. One of these matches is another bout that was pretty well built up in the weeks before the show, and another is a hot match in general that features, well, men. The first of these bouts is known as the Miss Wrestling Universe match because it features four of the prettiest ladies in Joshi. The team of JWP's Hikari Fukuoka and FMW's Megumi Kudo take on AJW's Takako Inoue and JWP's Cutie Suzuki. A big lump of the promotion for this match revolved around Takako, who had a photo book out with some risque shots in it, and there is also a little bit of drama. Megumi Kudo had accused Takako Inoue of leaking pictures to the press that featured her and her boyfriend. The match itself is fine. It's definitely a bit of a come down from the intense action that we've just seen, but it still keeps up the momentum. Again, we get some awesome spots. Takako Inoue likes to do this fantastic stalling tombstone variation where she'll happily knee the hell out of her opponent's head while she's got her up, and being that this is the big egg, she's naturally going to do that on the ramp. In the end, we're pretty much left with Takako and Kudo going at it, and this time it's the FMW star who gets the win. Inoue struggles, but Kudo hits a couple of Kodome drivers to get the free count after around 14 minutes. A perfectly fine tag match. Not an essential watch, but decent. Following that match, it's time for the Michinoku Pro folks to take the stage. Now you may wonder why we've got this match here on a woman's wrestling card, but Zenjo and Michinoku Pro had a working relationship. High-flying Joshi stars such as Kaoru and Chapurito Asari had already appeared on Michinoku cards before now, so this kind of makes sense. This six-man sees Kaintai DX's Sato, Dick Togo, and Shiru teaming with the great Sasuke to take on Gran Naniwa, Jinsei Shinzaki, and Super Delphin. This is not exactly the most essential of Michinoku Pro six-man tags, as you might expect. A lot of this is centred more around comedy action, but we do get bits of high flying here and there. Eventually Sasuke gets the win for his team, pinning Naniwa with a Thunderfire powerbomb. On the one hand, this match does act like another interlude of sorts. It certainly has a place on the card, giving plenty more time for folks to pick up merch or whatever if they've not done so yet. On the other hand, this match is 21 minutes and 45 seconds and… well, this show is long enough. The big problem with Big Egg Universe is most definitely the show's ridiculous length, and as the supercard gets closer to the finish, that's going to become a really big problem. Now I'm not saying that this would be the first match I'd cut, certainly not over all the different style bouts that happened earlier in the show, but a 20 minute good but still totally inconsequential match like this one, when we're already around 8 hours into the event? I wouldn't be surprised if this started making people shift in their seats a bit, or perhaps start thinking about the train timetable. And so, it's time for the VTOP semi-finals. We waste little time as we get into this first one. Toyoda is, again, dressed splendidly, while Hakuto is out in pink for this semi. Hakuto actually gets the jump on the bigger Toyoda here, as opposed to what happened in her quarterfinal. She's quick to strike with a spin kick, and a big Topekon Hilo from the top to the outside. Combat, however, does redress the balance with a really freaking nasty backdrop driver. Real eesh, that one. This and the combat driver aren't quite enough though, and Hakuto retains control after a sunset flip from the top and a northern light suplex. 
Toyota gets back in again when she's able to press slam Hakuto from the rin all the way to the floor, and she starts to get into her wheelhouse, bringing a table into the rin. However, this will be her undoing. A powerbomb, Toyota positions Hakuto on the table and goes to the top. However, Hakuto dodges the leg drop attempt. This looks nasty. Toyota lands right on the edge of the table, and as we all know, those Japanese tables really don't give a whole lot. Hakuto is quick to seize the advantage, lifting up the agonised combat Toyota and hitting the Northern Lights bomb for the win in a handily quick 5 minutes 47. As you may well have expected, the Dangerous Queen is going to be in the final. Is this the least essential match of the VTOP tournament? Yes, absolutely. Not bad or anything, but certainly a short one. Kinda wonder if this match may have had to be cut a little bit. Toyoda bows out, but even if this bout is not a classic, the match she had with Yumiko Hotter certainly was. Now, the second semi-final? You can definitely expect more fireworks here. Arja Khan and Dynamite Kansai already have something of a rivalry, seeing as they're the two toughest SOBs in their respective companies. They've fought each other a couple of times, and so far Arja has come out on top, but it's certainly been a fantastic watch. The order of the day here is certainly going to be strikes. You can tell that pretty quick when Khan hits Kansai with the Uraken right off the bat. Kansai is quick to recover with big strikes and clotheslines of her own, while also trying to ground Khan. The ground stuff never lasts too long, however, as this pair happily get on with blasting each other with every hard hit in their arsenal. And of course, it's utterly gripping to watch. Kansai nails some more hard hits and gets Con up for the Splash Mountain after a struggle, but it's not quite enough. Another vicious Uraken almost results in a KO, but Kansai is able to get up. Yet more vicious hammers, and another Uraken knocks her down again, but once again she pushes through and hits a backdrop. Con catches her in the corner though for a massive water wheel drop and near fall. Kansai still fights, swinging for the fences with roundhouse kicks, but Con dodges, Kansai blocks two Urakens, but doesn't block a third, and a fourth. Amazingly Kansai kicks out again, but Con will not be denied, and a final, decisive Uraken is enough to give Arja the win in 12 minutes 22. Again, an absolutely fantastic match. Different from the match that Con had with Toyota, but not all that far away from it. This was a remarkable, exceptionally stiff battle between two tough bastards, and once again Con just about has the edge against Dynamite Kansai. Meaning that, as you may well have expected, it's going to be Arja Khan versus Akira Hakuto in the final, a match we should expect a lot from. However, there is one more bout before we get there. Our semi-main of the night will, in case you've forgotten, revolve around the WWF Women's title. Alundra Blaze has come over, and she'll be defending against Bull Nakano. Nakano's already started working for the WWF, and the pair had a big match at SummerSlam. Nakano hit Blaze hard, but the champion just about came out on top. Being that this is the semi-main, the entrances are naturally full of pomp, especially Alundra's. She comes out at the head of a big old motorcycle posse, riding out to the ring complete with old glory waving about. Hey, maybe if there was a little bit more room, she could have come out in a monster truck. <sighs> sure beats having a five minute bout in the middle of a card at a house show in a high school gym, doesn't it? So this match is certainly treated like a big deal, but the crowd aren't exactly super responsive for it. This isn't necessarily to do with Nakano and Blades. This work may not be at the intensity of the match we've just seen, but they're not doing wholly bad things out there. It's more that we're now at around 11pm, the show's been going for 9 hours, and the crowd is absolutely exhausted by this point. That and there's also quite a lot less of them. A lot of people had to leave before the show was over. For a start, anyone who was under 18 and unsupervised had to be home by 10.30pm due to a curfew, and then, well a lot of people had to leave just so they could catch their last train home. And so, by this point, a pretty significant chunk of the crowd had gone. That said, there were still around 30 to 35,000 enthusiastic yet very tired people in the dome by this point. The match itself isn't anything special. Bull and Alundra don't go all that long, with the match clocking in at 9 minutes 27, which is probably for the best. This is about where Bull pretty much has an answer for anything that Blaze throws at her. 
the defending champion simply can't get that much in in the way of offence. Despite this, she still gets a few hope spots. She's even able to nail her German suplex finisher, which is how she beat Nakano at SummerSlam, but this time Nakano kicks out. Eventually, the ball's various and vicious moves are too much. Blaze is thoroughly defeated after Nakano lands the guillotine leg drop. Nakano's victory is treated like a big moment, she's lifted up to the skies by Kyoko Inoue, and it's all treated as if Nakano's just won a major, major title. It's how a big belt should be treated, isn't it? Shame that the belt's not treated that way by the WWF. Anywho, it is certainly a very big and very happy moment for Nakano, who'll hold the title for 134 days before dropping it back to Alundra. This reign, and this moment in particular, being the main thing talked about in her very recent and much deserved WWE Hall of Fame induction. And with that, we come to the 23rd and final match of the evening. The final of the VTOP tournament is the expected one, Akira Hakuto vs Arja Kong. Both have had pretty different paths to get here. Hakuto has arguably faced the two weakest participants of the field in the shape of Eagle Sawai and Combat Toyoda, although both of them certainly outweighed her, as does her final opponent. Arja Khan, meanwhile, has had an exceptionally tough route through the field. Manami Toyota in the first round and Dynamite Kansai in the semi final? Hell, it's likely not possible to get any harder than that. Both Arja Khan and Akira Hakuto make their way down into the arena from an elevator, and this time Akira Hakuto is in her usual colours, the white. And well, with all the pre-match introductions and ceremony out of the way, it's time to get on with this match. It is after all around about 11.20pm. If you're still here at this point, you've committed to missing that last train and likely having an expensive cab ride home or stay in a hotel or whatever so you should be able to muster something for this bout. As you may expect, this does take a similar form to the previous two Hakuto bouts, with the bigger person making use of that advantage. However, Con is clearly a much more capable and formidable opponent, and she's very quick to pepper Hakuto with those ruthless kicks, slaps and charges. The first few minutes are virtually all larger, with Hakuto only ever getting fleeting glimpses of offence, usually used to try and ground Arja and weaken her limbs. That's only brief and clearly not the way, however. Hakuto tries to match strikes with Con, but well, that's probably not a good idea either, as evidenced by the harsh slaps that Arja responds with, not to mention the nasty jump in power driver that follows. As Arja stretches the hell out of Hakuto in a half crab, it's hard to see just how Hakuto can solve this problem. She's barely been able to lay a finger on Arja Khan. But then, a turnabout does come. Arja chucks Hakuto to the outside with a suplex, and then tries something unexpected a tope. Hakuto dodges, and the tope goes badly wrong. Arja really catches her leg on those ropes, and Hakuto quickly follows with a somersault plancher from the post. However, something is hideously won. Arjakon is screaming, in total agony. It's a serious blowout to the right knee. But still, after a fairly extensive break and a bunch of bandages, Arjakon will continue. It should be noted that the last time this pair faced each other in August of 1993, it was Hakuto who would end up with a blown out knee that eventually affected the result of the match. And now, well, the shoe's on the other foot. I'm almost hesitant to say that this is entirely storyline, because Arja's selling of this knee injury is as convincing and as emotional as you can get. It's really something. But in any case, Hakuto absolutely takes advantage. She's certainly not going to leave the damaged limb alone, no matter how much it hurts. Hakuto appears keen to finish quick, and after some more punishment to the knee, the Dangerous Queen hits two Northern Lights bombs. However, Arja kicks out. Almost out of nothing, Con throws a desperation Nuaken and hits the mark, giving her much needed recovery time, and she then follows this up with a Northern Lights bomb of her own. However, keeping on the attack is hard, the knee constantly playing up, and Arja having to punch it to get the feeling back. Another Northern Lights bomb from Arja, and another near fall. The amount of finishers here almost has shades of a present day WWE main event bout, especially when they're stolen ones. Arja tries to go for a splash but misses and has to get out again. When she comes back, Hakuto hits her with witchcraft for another near fall. 
Hakuto goes for some missile drop kicks, but even despite the injured knee, Arja still attacks the second attempt with a kick, seriously trying to guts it out now. Arja tries a top rope move, but Hakuto reverses for a Nadawa Atoshi. Even though Arja can barely walk, she's still able to intercept Hakuto for another Uriken, although hardly a full strength one, she can't get the rotation. A big backdrop from Arja makes you wonder if she can somehow eke this out, but Hakuto's able to dodge another Uriken and nearly roll Arja up. For Arja, the knee, at this point, goes out for good. Hakuto takes no further chances. One Northern Lights Bomb, two Northern Lights Bombs, three Northern Lights Bombs. And with that, Akira Hakuto pins Arja Khan in 20 minutes 24 to win the VTOP tournament. As we get close to the stroke of midnight, we get a rather emotional finish. The pair are, as you can imagine, utterly exhausted. Arjakon actually presents the red belt, her WWWA title, to Hakuto, saying that this should be her title now. However, after the various ceremonies, the big check, the trophy and all of that, Hakuto refuses to take that red belt. Eventually, the pair are crying on each other's shoulders. There's a promise from Akira Hakuto that she'll be here when AJW run the Tokyo Dome again next year, and with that, well we're finally about done with the show. What to say about this final match? It is an odd one in many ways, the inner inaction and the story here is incredible, of course. Arja's selling, and we'll have a lot more to say about her performance in general, is truly something else. It's just a shame that the crowd were, by this stage, clearly so, so tired. If this were a shorter show, if the dome had still been full and this match had taken place earlier, a brilliant storytelling match like this may well have blown the Big Egg's roof off, but the crowd just couldn't give that sort of response, and that's not really on them. That's on AJW for booking such a stupidly long show in the first place. As for the winner? Well, what with the retirement story and all of that, you may well have expected Hakuto to come out on top in the end. It is, though, still an odd little one. In many ways, Hakuto's win in this tournament, particularly with what happens in the aftermath, basically feels like an unofficial WWWA title win. Although Hakuto doesn't actually win Arja's red belt, she did beat her. And yet, the main reason why Hakuto beat Arja was because of an unfortunate injury. Arja needed to have that injury in order for this to be pulled off. And so, oddly, despite losing in the end, and because of her other performances on the night, Arja kinda comes out looking stronger in the end because she gutted it out so damn much. With Hakuto getting that injury in their 1993 match, and Arja getting an injury in this one, it would have been great to have another decisive singles match between the pair, with both at full strength. Alas, that didn't happen. So, just how successful was this card? It may have been an utterly stupid length and all of that, but Big Egg Universe was an absolute stonker of a success for all Japan women. The 42,500 strong gate was equal to about $4 million, four times the amount that the original Dream Slams gate had taken. You had well over a million, perhaps even two million, in merchandise sales. Just the program alone took in $612,000, and then you had the TV broadcasting and the sponsorships. Just about every match on the card had some sort of sponsor. That white there's another million dollars. Easy. The Big Egg Universe tapes would also very soon be on sale at AJW shows for the low, low price of $316 for the full four tape set, so that's another big source of revenue right there. And you'd also have a PC Engine CD game, a title in the Fire Pro series using the show's branding. All in all, Zenjo's gross revenue for this show was likely around the $8 million mark, a truly phenomenal number. Around about $1.15 million was spent on the show's staggering production, and that was most certainly worth it considering just how damn amazing this show looked with all the big entrances, laser lights and what have you. In the end, this was an absolute triumph of a show in the Dome, more than comparable to the supercars that were won by the Big Egg's more regular residents, such as New Japan. Hell, Meltzer happily compared the gross revenue of Big Egg Universe to WrestleMania, and this was a show without any pay-per-view. As overlon and ridiculous as the show might have been, you can hardly argue with such success. As for the quality of the show, well it is pretty damn good for the most part. It's not quite on the level of the Dream Slam, but it's not that far off. 
The VTOP tournament is most certainly where it's at, and Lair is undoubtedly one MVP Lair. There aren't many one-night performances better than Arja Khan's here. Arja Khan was the star in three classic bouts, all of which were very different from each other. Any one of those three bouts would have easily been the match of the night on near enough every card in the world, but to have all of them in one night? It's an absolutely outrageous performance. If someone asked me to point to an example as to why Arja Khan is one of the very greatest wrestlers of all time, I would go straight to this VTOP tournament performance as it's got absolutely everything, from the sheer power to the mega strikes, the incredible pace and moves, the dominant arrogance to, in the end, the agony and emotion. It may well be the best performance in any one night tournament ever, and I'm including the Super J Cup in that estimation. Outside of the tournament, there's certainly a lot of other good stuff, even if it all does kind of play second fiddle. Some cracking opening hits, a great Legends match that ended up bringing some fine talents back into the fold, the sheer entertainment from acts like LCO, Takako Inoue, Shinobi Kandori and Toshio Yamada. It doesn't all come off perfectly, and obviously there's a fair few different style bouts that could have been cut out, but when it comes to flat out wrestling, this show has a damn fine hit rate considering that there's 23 matches on it. You probably shouldn't try to watch the whole thing in one go, but split up over a couple of sessions? It's definitely worth a look. It is, after all, the high watermark for women's wrestling in terms of big shows, and the high watermark for all Japan women. At the end of the show, Akira Hokuto did promise everyone that she'd be back for the next time that the company was in the Big Egg. But of course, there would not be a next time. As much as AJW's show, match and talent quality remained high, the various dealings that the Matsunaga brothers had in real estate and other assorted business ventures meant that as Japan's 1990s recession lengthened and worsened, their finances would be absolutely wrecked, and with it, so would the finances of all Japan women. The Joshi bubble bursts in the second half of the 1990s, with 1997 in particular being a disastrous year. It's at this time that the scene completely fragments, with plenty of promotions like the aforementioned new setups, Jigusa Nagayo's Gaia Japan and Jaguar Yokota's JD Star, as well as Arja Khan's Arsian, Kyoko Inoue's Neo Ladies and plenty more. A lot of the talent we've seen in this video will still be active, and these promotions will end up being good in their own right although the scene does get tougher to follow. Eventually, as the Joshi scene heads further into a darker age, 2005 will see the hammer finally fall on All Japan Women. In April, the company, which was at the time the longest one in wrestling promotion in Japan, closes its doors for good. Things are certainly a hell of a lot better for Joshi now than they were in those dark days, but Big Egg Universe still remains a seemingly unattainable summit 30 years later. Is it the greatest Joshi show of all time? Perhaps not, but it's certainly the biggest by a long distance, and it more than deserves its spot in the annals of wrestling history. Hopefully you've enjoyed this look back at it, and until next time, bye for now.